Hi there, everybody. Uh, my name's Sarah Young. Uh, I work for Microsoft, and today I'm going to be talking to you about doing SecOps in a cloud native environment. So let's uh, let's crack on. It's first, I'll introduce myself. Uh, if you haven't met me before, if you don't know me, uh, I am an Azure security architect. I live in Melbourne, which if you're not familiar with where that is in Australia, it's actually the colder and wetter bit. I'm actually currently in New Zealand though, uh, thanks to COVID. Um, as you may have known, if you've been watching the news, New Zealand is not the worst place in the world to be at the moment though. So uh, I'm, I'm very lucky. Um, I love doggos, as you can see, um, that is my parents' dog. Um, I don't have my own, but one day I will. Uh, before I worked in security um, and cloud native things, I used to be a network and a VoIP engineer, uh, but now, um, as you might have gathered from my job title, I do all kinds of cloud security stuff, including security operations, um, uh, and that's uh, my focus at the moment. Um, I'm gonna apologize in advance for the background. This is my friend's spare room, who has very kindly been putting me up for the last four months. So um, if it looks like I'm a little bit in a prison, I promise I'm not. But um, yeah, um, and thank you, Erica, for putting me up. Um, if you've seen any of my presentations before, I am a prolific user of GIFs or GIFs and memes in my presentations. Hopefully they will make sense. If they don't, I'll try and explain them. Um, one more note, as I go through this presentation, I will uh, we, you feel free to put um, any questions you have in the chat window. Um, I'll be hanging around to answer them. Um, afterwards or of course you can always get me on the twitters uh, my handle is on the slides there as well so whatever works for you so what am i actually going to talk about today uh today i'm going to talk about why security operations are important i'm going to do a quick recap of how we did security operations on premise uh i'm going to talk about the what the who and the how and the when of security operations and then finally we're going to talk use cases because use cases are probably one of the most important things in security operations. They are so, so, so important. Um, on the right here, this is um, a dog um, in Melbourne. Um, he has his own YouTube channel called Tofu Chan. I think he's adorable. I couldn't think of anything to put here, but on one of his videos, he was hacking. So I thought that would go well with the security thing. As you can see, some of these some of these uh, GIFs and memes I add can sometimes be a little bit tenuous, the links, but go with it. So firstly, let's talk a little bit about why security operations are important. Now, hopefully any of you who are watching this, you you must be at least somewhat interested in security and you, 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 know, you should probably have a good idea of why security operations are important, but you know, doing this this sort of stuff properly costs money and it takes time. And how do you justify that to your management or people who pay the bills? I always like to start with one of these uh, one one of these me memes. Um, information security, as you can see, what my parents think I do. They think I'm a hacker. They they really do. I am not. Uh, what I actually do. Um, which of course is, uh, uh, and, and what society thinks I do, which is of course the guy with the hoodie there. Uh, what IT managers think I do, which is burn money. And that's true. Security has always been traditionally very hard to justify because if security is working well, you don't see any sort of visible, tangible benefits in quite the same way. It just means that you haven't been hacked. And by the time you've been hacked, it's far too late. Uh, but I always love throwing in that one one of these in. There wasn't a security operation specific one, and I do digress a little bit, but I love to have one of these in. But, you know, moving on to, and coming back to that other part about your boss thinking that you just burn money, um, why should you spend money and invest your time and effort in security operations? Um, well, I just pulled some of these, I, I just put in uh, Kubernetes, hacks and you know look you can see there's been plenty of things over the years and and there's more and more coming and in the wider security environment there are heaps and stacks of hacks and breaches that are happening all the time uh you 
you may remember the Kubernetes first major security hole discovered. Um, that was actually done by researchers and there was no evidence that it was exploited in the wild, but it was a big security hole. Of course, we most of us will have known and loved the Tesla uh, story there. And of course, Docker has had breaches and we know that there are lots of images as well that can be compromised and have crypto miners in. Basically, security operations is a problem everywhere. And it's not going away. So it is important that we care about it. Just to give you a little bit more of an idea of, of like the threat environment, like, and this comes from Microsoft's security threat intel, you know, attack services aren't very expensive. They're actually really cheap. Um, the first one I want to talk about here is zero days. Now, a zero day, as I'm sure you know, is a kind of attack that doesn't have any patch or mitigation. Um, and zero days, other things that often businesses are really, really worried about because a zero day has no mitigation, has no patch. You know, how are you going to protect yourself against a zero day? The re but if we have a look at that compared to some of the other attacks out there, just to put in proportion, uh, developing a zero day can be quite expensive. Whereas if we look at things like exploit kits, um, these prices are in US dollars by the way. Um, if we look at exploit kits, you know, that's costing um, uh, $1,400 a month. Uh, ransomware, and this is a funny one, so bear with me. Um, ransomware, you can now go on the dark web and you can ask, you can pay someone to do ransomware on your behalf, and then they will take 30% of the profit. So it's almost like ransomware as a service. It's very strange, but this does exist on the dark web. Or you could pay someone $66 and just get the ransomware software and do it yourself. Um, to get compromised devices, um, it's under a dollar, maybe a little bit more for a mobile device. Uh, compromised accounts, we know there are compromised accounts dumped all over the internet. Uh, you know, it's, it's only costing $150 for 400 million accounts. I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> And we know that uh, if you use the same username and password combination in in anything in in the world and um, you use that same username and password combination in a compromised place and then also use it in another place, but it's but it's already floating around the internet. You've just basically given some attacker the keys to your kingdom. Uh, denial of service, which is always um, a classic that costs for a month under $800. So looking at that compared with the zero day, which is 50, can be, you know, $50,000-ish to, you know, as a minimum to develop a zero day, you can see that for your average attacker, it's actually much cheaper and easier to go for some of these other types of attacks. So whilst I'm not saying you shouldn't care about zero days, just remember to put it into uh, put it into proportion as to how likely it is you'll be hit with a zero day over some of these other much more common attacks. I also wanted to recap on some of the typical security operations issues that we've seen. And we saw this in on-premise environments and we're seeing this going into cloud native environments as well. There are so many products out there and often you will have monitoring for one thing, you'll have monitoring for another thing and it'll all be different. And you know, you'll have to jump through different portals, which can be difficult if the products don't roll up into one thing. It, it just takes more time to go through them and try and understand what the issue is. Uh, there's never enough SOC analysts. If you're a SOC analyst, I'm pretty sure you've got a job for life because it is really, really difficult to find enough SOC analysts. Alongside that, environments are only getting more and more and more complex. So it is, you know, it's making all the different signals and actually monitoring all these environments really hard. Um, and in, with a cloud native spin on this, if we look at Kubernetes and containerized environments, uh, security operations are still understanding how those those environments work often. So before, until you understand how something works, how can you monitor it successfully? Uh, most SOCs and are still also depending on really manual processes and they just have too many alerts. I don't think I have to explain this GIF, it's uh, fairly it's fairly obvious, but uh, the research shows that something like 40% of alerts that come into security operations never actually get looked at, 
which is crazy. Now, of course, with security operations, there's always the possibility of false positives. That's, that's always there. But if you wouldn't even know if an alert was a false positive, if you never even got around to looking at it. So, you know, these, these are the problems that everybody faces. So this phrase, single pane of glass, is used a lot in security operations. Uh, it's used a lot by vendors. And they will say, you know, I really need to have a single pane of glass to look at everything that's going on in my environment. And that's actually really difficult it, because you can definitely reduce the number of portals you look at, but it is genuinely difficult for any relatively large complex organization to have a single pane of glass. And I think that's really important uh, to remember that I, I personally don't feel you need to get to a single pane of glass, but perhaps maybe just one or two panes. And, and you'd probably, you'd be doing much, much better than most organizations. So I always want to, yeah, um, be cautious around this particular phrase. Um, you know, shatter that pane of glass, have at least a few of them and you'll probably be okay. Silos are not good. And we see this in lots of different organizations all, all around, um, you know, all over the world, we see silos in IT generally, but looking at it from a security operations lens, um, you know, silos are really, really not good. Now, this uh, particular, uh, the GIF I imported here isn't working, but I'll describe it to you. It was these two American Olympic athletes basically banging into each other uh, from the back because they weren't looking or talking to each other. Uh, this is what came up when I put silo into Giphy. So work with me, that's what I'm going with. But there is a reason that silos are bad. And silos are bad because if you think of it from the perspective of an attacker, if you've got your little identity, uh, you've got your little identity silo, you've got email, you have applications, say you might have cloud native, um, whatever, you know, the, your attacker will not just sit in one of your different silos. You know, they're gonna go across the whole system. They're gonna go across your whole environment looking for things of value for them. So it's really important that when you do security operations, you don't piece it up. Like security operations need to cover everything. It's really, really important. So as you can see here, I have my dragon and my defender there on his horse. And you know, this dragon has just gone across everything because he's just looking for things of value that he can use as an attacker. Um, and uh, if you just have different attackers, uh, different defenders, I mean, for each silo, you know, it's not going to be easy to catch up with this guy or girl or, or them. So how do we do security operations on premise? This is important to understand because it just helps us understand how we should be doing it going forward. Um, so I think it's important to recap this. Now, I'm sure most of you, um, we'll see on the day um, of the con how many people use the castle analogy because it comes up so frequently when we do security presentations. But the traditional security approach, of course, was to have a big, uh, uh, using the castle analogy, we would have big perimeter walls, we'd have a moat, and it would be really difficult to breach that perimeter. But if you did breach the perimeter, then you'd be able to get in and just attack all the assets. Now, um, that does, uh, that, that approach has been around for a while. Of course, now we're moving to zero trust, which is great. But uh, from security operations, we also have to remember to modernize our approach here as well. Uh, there's another aspect to this, um, and I have a sticker which, were we doing this in person, I would be happy, happily giving out to all of you, um, that says collection is not detection. Because in traditional security operations, we would just collect every single log we possibly could. Um, these amazing stickers were uh, made by Pepper Raccoon. She's an amazing New Zealand-based artist. If anyone needs sticker art being to be done, by the way, I can thoroughly recommend her. She's done quite a few for me. Uh, but um, with this, th what we used to do is just collect all the logs, collect as many logs as we possibly could. And that was great, but if you don't do anything with them, if you're not running detections or you're not proactively hunting with them, there's actually not so much point collecting them. Um, now, I've seen it time and time again. And also sometimes the focus of collection can be wrong. So in traditional SIEM environments, you would very much focus on collecting from those perimeter 
devices, so like firewalls and stuff. Whereas going forward, we actually need to be collecting more holistically across the entire environment. I'll see if uh, this is uh, this is this this was animated, but it doesn't look like it's working now. But this was a uh, crazy cat lady, and the reason um, I put crazy cat lady was it came up for collecting things. So obviously, this lady has collected cats. Probably this many cats is not a good idea, <laughs> not a good idea at all. But you get the idea. Like collecting just all the logs for the sake of it is not a great approach. Um, um, so you know, we we're really encouraging people that when you're going into um, when you're using a cloud native environment and when you're setting up new types of applications, of course you should be logging things, but think carefully about what you want to log. Don't just log all the things. So let's get on to actually how you would do this then. You know, how, what, who, when, how do you do this then? Because I've told you about how not to do it and how we used to do it, but how do we actually do it? So to start with, you need to make a choice. Um, in your SecOps environment about how you're going to run SecOps going forward. So there's, there's basically three choices. You could go cloud only. You could run a hybrid environment, so some cloud and some on-premise, or you could go fully on-prem. Now, that hybrid might be a transitional state as well. You might go hybrid for a number of years, what, um, assuming that you're on a typical organization's cloud journey, which is to put more and more workloads into the cloud and go cloud native then you might have to run an on-prem scene for a time and then migrate over. So th there's different options here, but I think what's important is that you actually make a, make a, um, a very conscious choice about what you want to do here, rather than just kind of going along with your old on-prem seam until it runs out of space. So it's it's something to think about. Um, I don't want to give prescriptive advice as what every organization should do here, but I think it's worth thinking about the pros and cons of all of them, um, and and how it fits into your overall trans, uh, you know, journey for as an organization for the next five or ten years. Old man yells at cloud. I always try and get into my presentations, by the way, because how could you not? And so here we go. I've talked a lot about what I don't think you should collect. So let's talk a bit more about what you should. So you should be collecting logs from pretty much most parts of your application stack. So not just your infrastructure, not just the firewalls, not just your orchestrator, and not just the pods, and not just your application. I kind of put a lot of knots. And the reason, and I kept this very general, um, one of the big challenges with security operations is it's very difficult for us to give for anybody, um, any vendor, any um, any framework, anything. It's very difficult to give prescriptive information about what logs for a particular customer or their environment should should you collect. We You can give general guidance as to what's good um, on what potentially is useful or what is useful for the majority of people. But at the end of the day, it's really, really hard to do so, which is why I can only offer some general guidance. Um, I'm going to talk more about use cases uh, shortly. And use cases is a, um, working through use cases is probably the best way to determine precisely what you want to precisely what you want to collect here. And who? So, you know, who 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 are you going to ask to do this? Um, wh who are the tools? I realize that grammar is actually terrible. Who are the tools or products? That is very poor grammar. Um, apologies for anybody who's very fussy about grammar. But you know, what are the tools that you can use uh, to to get the visibility you need? Now, there's all kinds of tools out there. Um, just to give you some oversights of some of the types of tools you should be looking at, um, I would recommend looking at vulnerability scanning. Um, you should definitely have a SIEM. SIEM stands for Security Information and Events Management. Uh, runtime security. Um, you may need auditing and policy tools. And of course, if there's one thing that we need in, in uh, a containerized environment, please have image repositories. I don't mind whose image repository you use, but please use one. Uh, today isn't the day or the time to talk about whether you want to go for paid commercial tools versus open source. There are both out there for all of these types of capabilities. Uh, I think it really comes down to your organization's need. Um, and if you can put probably 
additional time into configuring and playing around with open source because they tend to need a bit longer. Um, so this is, isn't the time to talk about that. I'd happily have a conversation with you offline about it, uh, but it's also something to consider. And when do you need to do security operations? You need to do it all the time. I, I only use Pingu. I know it's not Pingu. Um, it's his friend. But I only do this because all the time. You must be doing this all the time. Um, you you need to iterate security operations throughout your entire environment. You know, you should be doing it um, image creation to the storage, to deployment, to the runtime, to the teardown. That entire life cycle you should have some visibility of. So you can actually, if someone is manipulating something, you would know because you if you can't see it, you will not know what's happening. Um, and so, you know, you've got to, whenever you're designing something or creating a new environment or standing up something new, you know, do ask the question or put it to your security operations team if it's not you specifically. You know, how are we going to monitor this? How are we going to integrate it? Because, you know, they might not necessarily come to you and and just say hey we need to integrate this please please go to them and ask them you know how we, how are you going to do this how are we going to get visibility of this from a security perspective and then the last thing i wanted to talk about because i know i'm nearly up for time is i want to talk about use cases now this is one of those easy ones but also not easy and i only have one slide with identical bullet points which is understand your use cases. I also really like using clickbaity titles because it amuses me. So apologies if you hate them. But one of the best things you can do in security operations is understand your use cases. And use cases will vary from organization to organization. But for example, if you said it's really important for us that if our CEO, uh, if our CEO logs in from any country that's not the US, you know, we need to raise that as a high priority incident immediately because our CEO never goes outside of the US, for example. You know, that's a use case specifically for an organization. Um, and then you can say, OK, this is my use case. What logs do I need to be able to have visibility if that scenario occurs? Uh, and then you can say, OK, so we need to collect X and Y in order to enable that. And then you can work it through. And it means also that if you're collecting logs, you have justification for why you're collecting them. This is also the time, but again, we don't have time to go into this, um, that we can mention the MITRE ATT&CK framework and the different tactics. Uh, there are many different tactics in the MITRE ATT&CK framework. And if you're an organization that's looking to specifically stop some of those tactics, uh, you can help use that framework to map as well. But if you know your use cases, then you can justify why you're doing what you're doing in security operations. So do have a think about it. Have a think about, you know, the, and different use cases for different business units as well. It won't just be you. Like, what do you need to know? What's important for you from a security perspective? And then you can work back from there and say, OK, how do I actually get there? What logs do I need and what kind of detections would I need to run uh, to, to know if that was happening or if that wasn't happening? So, again, I could talk for hours and hours on use cases. I just wanted to kind of surface it here to get you thinking. Um, and yeah, I think I'm pretty much up for time. Um, so just to conclude, you know, I've got to put up there that this is fine because um, there's, no, there's, there's no one meme that describes security operations than this. Um, but you don't want to be in this position. Don't get to this position before you start thinking about or reassessing how well your security operations are doing. Like think about it before then, because by the time this has happened, you know, it's going to be a lot harder. You've probably got some kind of breach or compromise to clear up and just just try and do it right from the word go. Um, if you're a developer watching this and you think, well, you know, security isn't my focus, that's cool. Like go and talk to your security operations team or somebody in who's got more responsibility for security and, and brainstorm with them. It might more be they need to deal with it, but make sure they're aware that you've got a system that you think needs to have some monitoring or visibility over it. Now, and with that, I've talked, um, I'm pretty sure I'm up for time. So I wanted to say thank you very much for listening to me today. Uh, uh, I really appreciate your attention. I hope you found that useful and it got you thinking. Security operations is a massive topic and 
there's only so much I can go through in, in 25, 30 minutes, but um, feel free to ask any more questions in the chat window. I'll try and answer them. Or you can hit me up on Twitter. Um, and thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and the rest of KubeCon Virtual. And uh, stay safe and have a great rest of your day. <laughs> cool. Hello, everyone. As you can see, I, I was going to actually wear the same outfit, but I didn't. Um, so apologies. <laughs> um, so um, I just realized as well, I was looking through the questions and I changed the sort from uh, from newest to priority. So sorry, there's a couple that I've just seen. Um, uh, so I'm going to go through these ones live um, and if anyone and I'll keep going until I run out of time. Hopefully I'll get through them all. Um, so um, social engineering security. Um, the question was, what was my opinion on social engineering security and should we do it? So I've been working in security for six, seven years now. It is. Um, basically, uh, most companies as a consultant and doing lots of different types of security testing, in my experience, most companies do not want to do social engineering testing because usually people fail because people are always your weakest link. And uh, having a report from a consultancy saying, hey, we got into your uh, we got into your system or we got into your office and then we subsequently managed to get into your system is real tricky. Um, and um, so I would say, um, is it a good thing? Yes. Um, but in reality, do lots of people want to do it? No, because having an official report written from a consultancy saying that people just walked into your office um, and they managed to get a password off your users, people don't like to see. So difficult to say, to be honest. Um, yeah, probably depends if you're more of a security hardcore person or you're a uh, or, or you're a management person, I'd say. <laughs> Um, I'm going to go from the bottom, just to be fair, um, from the most frequent. Um, one of them was, uh, one of the questions was, some, some runtime security tools need elevated privileges to run in your environment, and what is my take on those tools? You're right, some tools do. Good tools nowadays probably shouldn't need elevated privileges to run, but you're right, that is a thing for some tools. And I guess then you need to think about your, you've got to, I, I hate using this because it's such a, it's such a cop out, um, but you need to think about your security posture and, and security posture and risk profile and whether your work is using the security tool, uh, a decent trade-off for the potential or the likelihood that someone could actually breach said security tool running at elevated privileges. Um, Mark asks, were there recommendations on how to evaluate, evaluate whether use cases are effective? Um, yeah, um, most security monitoring tools, because um, you always get false positives, most security monitoring tools in some way, shape or form will let you log what's a true positive versus a false positive. So you can start to tweak things. So if your use case isn't quite right, you can understand it that way. And if you are, um, if, if you're not, if you're getting a lot of false positives, you probably want to tune up your rules and your use case around that. But um, use cases themselves are 10, because I think you're probably more talking about thresholds because use cases are more broad and use cases tend to be for particular businesses or scenarios, but how you trigger on a use case is the kind of thing you generally need to tweak. Um, oh, let's see. Um, oh, um, so one of my favorite visualization tools. Oh, there's so many. Oh, I can't even begin to think that's putting me on the spot. So I'm going to have to say, I can't actually think off the top of my head. Um, so there's another question here. Um, I've mentioned about MITRE attack framework and where do we use it for Kubernetes? Now, uh, the MITRE attack framework, if you're not familiar with it, um, uh, the MITRE attack framework is actually about uh, tactics that 
attackers use. So MITRE ATT&CK framework can be applied to basically any system. It's, it's written in that way. Um, there is uh, a really good, and I'll put it in the uh, chat, assuming this doesn't disappear when I'm up for time in 30 seconds or so. Um, I, uh, you, uh, there is uh, one of my colleagues uh, in Microsoft has actually written a really cool mapping of the MITRE ATT&CK tactics to different things in Kubernetes. I'll put the, it in the chat below. Um, but definitely you can use MITRE ATT&CK for everything. Um, so just have a look online. There's probably someone who's already done it. Um, but you can certainly, um, all the different tactics, so like uh, privilege escalation, et cetera, um, they all can be done in a Kubernetes context, but definitely the work's already been done. So just find uh, just, just find things out there um, that have already been done by other people. Um, and it'll get you more familiar with MITRE as well, um, because it's a good thing, even if you don't know it really well, to just have an idea of MITRE, uh, because it does, as I say, apply to every single system. And yeah. Um, I'm going to see, um, I, like I said, if the chat doesn't disappear, I'll, I'll work through the rest of the questions. I think I'm going to be up for time. So, uh, yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Um, and I hope you have a great cloud native security day. Um, it's pretty late here. It's coming up for midnight. So <laughs> hopefully it's not as late for the rest of you. And uh, yeah, have a great rest of your conference.